one call, sometimes that's two. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do tonight is really just kind of go through as much as I can an overview of kind of the issues that we spot when startups come in. And I get the fact that you guys are kind of developers, and so you may have a lot of interesting questions. So I'm going to try to give a lot of time for questions. But I think this should be more discussion in the talking head, and, and I think it'll be easier when you guys kind of ask specific questions from your react. But I'll, I will start with kind of an overview what we're seeing. And, and Perkins does have about 70 clients doing Bitcoin, so we see it all. Um, and they stand at the end of every possible, I don't know, no, they don't stand at the end of every possible. But we see new businesses coming through every day, so it's pretty interesting. Right? All right, so some of the some of the things that I, I think are, are important, probably you guys understand that the, the single most difficult issue uh, is money transmission. And, you know, some jackass decided to call it Bitcoin. And the fact that it's got coin in the name um, causes that problem, really. And the fact that it's fungible and the fact that it is essentially a monetary substitute causes that problem. People start to think of it as something that has currency-like qualities. And so um, money transmission immediately leaps to the mind of all the lawyers. And uh, you guys probably all, all know that there are federal laws, there are state laws, um, and there are 48 states that have money transmission laws. Money transmission very generally, very broadly, is, is literally, you know, you know, when you take money from one person, a third party takes money from one person and sends it to another. So there's three people involved, right? There's money goes from A to B to C. And you know, Bitcoin, unfortunately, because it has these monetary properties, has been deemed certainly by the feds and probably by the states as a form of money. And the issue uh, federally, I'll tell you, and again, I'm just going to kind of tell you very, you know, generally, um, what we're telling companies and, and kind of the, what you'll what you'll typically hear from us. We'll go through and do a very deep dive analysis on your cash flows, and really, it all very much depends on you know who is touching the money and, and where the money goes through. Um, but we'll take that cash flow sort of detailed diagram from from your company, and we'll go back and we'll say, okay, now who's the money transmitter in this scenario? And uh, in general, I think what we're seeing is you know. When there is a doubt, we will tell you you should be registered federally because FinCEN is actually relatively easy to register with. Um, and it really doesn't, it's, it's literally an online form you can fill out. You do have to have an AML policy, a KYC policy, and you do actually have to do those things that you commit to when you fill out that form. Um, but it's a reasonably easy process. Um, and there's a really draconian set of rules if you don't. And so we combine the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, criminal penalty if you don't, if, if you are required to and you don't federal, federally file, uh, and you combine the fact that it's relatively easy to do that, our advice is pretty simple. Practical advice is, you know, when in doubt, file federal. Problem with that, all right, what? So if I fork, say, a really awesome open source software like Ripple, uh, <laughs> And I don't, and I, you know, distribute a billions of these new cool open source tokens to people by for free uh, without charging them. Do I still have to register with FinCEN as a money transfer? Well, you're doing it all open source. It's all open source, and we're going to the stars. And so you're just a software developer, and you're not going to mine anything. Uh, we pre-mined it, <laughs> and we're going to give it away. What do you mean to give it away? It was all his in the beginning. We're going to give it but we're not going to redeem it. <laughs> so you pre-mine it, you give it away, but you keep some. That's right. So what you're hoping for is that people will have, it'll have some value. Are you, are you hoping that a secondary market develops it will have some value? If it does, we, it will just be, it'll just happen. We, we're <laughs> certainly not providing a secondary market. And we're not encouraging it. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you for sure that the, the guys in my shop are going to tell you 
federally, you should still file. And what do you file as? You file as a money transfer. You basically win it because, okay, here's, here's the thing. At the federal level, it's an administrator, right? And you're, you have mined this coin, you're the only one who can give it out. You've created it, you've mined it, you're giving it out. That's kind of an administrator of the coin from the federal perspective. So there's at least a risk. I think it's a low risk, actually. It, it, truth be told, I think that's a low risk if you're a federal money transmitter. But there's enough of a risk, and it's easy enough federally, that you probably should file. But let me get to the downside. The downside of filing federally as a money transmitter is you may lose your bank account. You know, your commercial banking relationships may get pulled. And you've got to be very solid with uh, a strategy on how to keep those commercial bank relationships intact if you're going to file federally. Is, is that because you're saying that you're associated with Bitcoin? No, well, it's because you're saying you're a money, you, you are a money transmitter, you're, you're, you're a um, money services business. And, and once you say that, in fact, it doesn't necessarily have to be Bitcoin. Banks these days are really nervous about any money services business. Um, and and so the reason they're, they're, they're nervous about money service businesses in general, not just Bitcoin, but any, any money service business. Because, you know, um, <coughs> There's a lot of people filing federally that, that uh, you know, there are, there are money service businesses that are outside of Bitcoin that banks can't deal with either. So, so look, this, this is a hard question. Tariq's asked a good, solid question, but the, the advice you're gonna get, probably from Perkins and probably from a lot of firms, is federally fought. Now, the, the harder question, the more interesting question, I think, is what to do with the states, because all 48 states that have money transmission laws are going to have a similar but slightly different regime. And the reality with, with state law is almost certainly you're going to get some kind of a letter. I say almost certainly because it's not certain. It could send an indictment, but they probably will. They will probably send you a letter that's a cease and desist letter first. So the, the risk is a lot lower at, at the state level. And so, you know, the reality is that the practical advice at the state level depends on how clearly you are a money transmitter or not. And so we're dealing with gray area. We're dealing with, you know, what do you do as a practical matter when the answer's not clear? And so for us, we make sort of a judgment call as a firm as to whether somebody is closer to the line of being a money transmitter or not. And we'll, we'll kind of give advice about that. You know, what should the company do as a practical matter? Should you file, you know, file federally is the first question. Should you, should you uh, pursue the a strategy of the states where you send a letter to each state and you say, hey, we'd like to get licensed you know, as a money transmitter in your state. Nine times out of ten, these days, you're going to get an answer back from the state that says something to the effect of, hold your horses, we don't have that particular regime figured out yet. So keep, it, keep us informed, but we don't really have a license for it. Um, the theory behind sending letters to the state, getting yourself on the radar, is that you know they're going to go easier on you, and everybody recognizes that this is this is the wild west, and that we're all innovating in, a, in an area where I think the law is unclear. And you're being an upstanding citizen by sending that letter. Now, if you're if you're far, far enough down the line where it's just as, you're not you're not a money transmitter, it's very clear that you're not, then we'll probably tell you, you know, look, it may not make sense to send that letter to the state. So that that's really the question that I think you have to wrestle with. Because as a practical matter, do you send a letter or do you not send a letter to the state? Put yourself on the radar screen. So this is money transmission. Yeah. Yeah, uh, something interesting I just thought of was um, you don't bother Yeah, sorry. Uh, when you play a video game, they say that you're not allowed to use in-game currency to trade for real-life currency. And uh, people still do. But apparently, the, with this clause saying you're not allowed to trade in-game money for out-of-game money because of the laws against money transmission. So what if all new coins said you're not allowed to trade this currency for fiat? And people still do. But it doesn't matter anymore because you're not allowed to. What if our friends to the stars say? 
What if say that again, Ryan? Oh. The friends, the friends that Tuck is talking about. Yeah. They just take pre mine and they're writing software and they're distributing their pre mine. They're not selling. What if they said, please don't sell this? Yeah. Hypothetically. It sounds like you have the planet. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, open, the open source thing is really a hard question because it, it's it's almost like there is no there to, like, who even runs this thing? Also, one more thing that I remember was when Satoshi released this, uh, this software, he said this could replace the money, right? So clearly, it's like saying you know, to the issuer, hey, I'm smarter than you, right? But if you make the altcoin, that's like, this is not money. <laughs> it's kind of like, not a joke. It's pretty viable, I guess. Well, let's, let's keep going, let's keep going, because there's an interesting, yeah, go ahead. If you could just uh, get perspective, now we're all thinking you know, Bitcoin, Wild West, and a lot of unknowns, but if you could sort of get some insights as to what's going on in the rest of the banking, the traditional banking industry, because like, I think there's a lot of turbulence just naturally in this sector, even outside of the Wild West Bitcoin. So banks are getting out of certain segments. Well, that's just, right. Just because I mean, it's, it's crappy. That's an important, so important just, point. Just make everybody aware. No, and, that, bank, and yes, it's not. You're under, you know, you're under the hot, hot lands because you're in the wild west. But, yeah, it's not just Bitcoin. I mean, that's it's important. Just, it's a really important concept and a piece of context. And again, banks are cracking down on all the money service businesses because there's a lot of interesting ones that are out there that are kind of uh, let's call it fringe. It's, that are not big financial institutions that are getting into this area. And there's a lot of innovation. My practice is mostly fintech in general, and Bitcoin happens to be one of the focuses. But there's a lot of really novel. When banks stopped lending in, in 2007, 2008, lots of really interesting businesses started to spring up, and you know uh, that has has led to a situation where there are a lot of startups getting into traditional financial services, peer-to-peer -peer lending, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, all kinds of distributed sort of network network stuff that, that is non-traditional and that, that uh, banks are scared of. And, and frankly, you know, um, I feel bad. I mean, you know, Silicon Valley Bank is probably one of the, one of the uh, most progressive banks, but, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just share a little bit of their pain because I, I sit down with those guys all the time and talk to the COO and talk to the guys that do the Bitcoin intake. And the reality is they're just overwhelmed. And, and, and there's so many of you guys trying to get a banking relationship, and the reality is, banks have serious obligations. I mean, really, they do. And and God bless you, you guys are you know you're, you're young and you're, you're enthusiastic and everything else, but you're not experienced and you don't know the banking bits. And and so to have you guys, you know, get to a point where you can really do the things that that needs you to do to have that relationship and be solid on AML, KYC, and the stuff that they really do need to do. Um, it's tough. It's, it's a lot of hand-holding. It's a lot of truly bandwidth-intensive kind of personal services that the bank has to provide in order to work with a company like a, like a Bitcoin startup. So they can only take in a certain number at a time and just get a block. I mean, that's, that's sort of the banking side of things. But let's keep talking because I, I, want, to, I want to keep follow, following up. Yeah. yeah uh, just, you know, you're talking about filing federal and filing the state. So what's the downside of doing it? You're saving yeah. it? Possibly, yeah. yeah, I mean, well, certainly the cost is one thing. You got to tie part of this. You have to layer in the timing of all this, right? You know, when do you do this? And certainly, as a startup company, you know, there's there's an element to you know you got to do what you got to do as a startup company. You kind of get to a proof of concept where somebody would even invest in the company before you have the money to really pursue any of these kinds of regulatory strategies. Um, and and that's a very tricky situation when you're talking about criminal statutes because you know you do not want to be the next Charlie Trump, right? And, and, and get into a situation where um, you know you, you were kind of trying to do the right thing and you were kind of doing a little bit cowboy and you kind of got out there ahead of yourself. Um, and and so it's important to know where that line really is. And I think getting good, you know, legal advice, whether it's Perkins or some other lawyer, to really get in, do your, do your legal strategy at, at a fairly early stage is pretty important. Um, there are law firms that will work with you guys to do that stuff at a rel relatively early stage. Um, 
and at least determine the strategy, determine kind of what it is, what regulatory regimes apply, what is this, what are the steps that we need to take in order to really start to operate. Um, have that kind of strategy laid out for your investors so that they know. Because investors, the main thing investors need is certainty. They need to know time, how much does it cost and how long is it going to take. And, and then the rest is technology. They can, they can, can analyze the technology, the regulatory piece, and investors just need to understand a little bit underneath, you know, kind of all the unknowns. You know, because the, the unknown is the thing that the investors hate the most. Right? Yeah. I agree with you what you say about FinCEN. It's pretty easy to register there as a yeah. family service business. You do have to deal with reporting consequences which flow from that once right. you do it, full stop. The state of California taking one as a money transmitter licensing entity is another story entirely. Are you aware of any Bitcoin financial service business that is actually applied oh, for a money transmitter sure. license in California? Yes. And once you do that, how do you avoid flying for the, the license in the other 47 states? Well, no, I, I think there's a there is a, a process of rolling out, and I do. I mean, I yes, but that's a nightmare. It, it is a nightmare, but uh, there's about three different buckets that states fall into. So depending on your model, what kind of company you are, and you know exactly how you are. Uh, money transmitter. Coinbase. Yeah, well, so Coinbase, I mean, is a direct sale model company. And so, you know, those guys buy the Bitcoin and then sell the Bitcoin, right? They're the counterpart to in the middle. And that direct sale kind of model works actually in about a third of the states, where the, the states that uh, have money transmission licenses um, that don't regulate a certain type, that don't have the right sort of magic language, don't cover that. <coughs> And so, you know, Coinbase can, can get away with about a third of the states, and the other two thirds, you know, they, they, they've got to send these letters to. Them. But that's a that's a that's a valid sort of strategy to say to somebody, okay, here's here's here are the states where you need to send a letter, and it might take you several months to do that to get all these letters out and kind of get all this stuff going. And we recognize you're probably not going to get any particular state to come back to you and say, sure, we'll give you a license. The reality is the only state out there today that has specific Bitcoin legislation proposed is New York, and that's the bit license that you guys have heard so much about. And you know, hopefully you all you know send comments on the bit license. That's one of my goals tonight is to really get you guys thinking about the bit license and thinking about sending some comments on it. It's but, the impulse of the state, so rather to say in response to your letter that uh, you better get on in here and start applying and we'll make a judgment as we go and know more about your business. Meanwhile, you're sucked into that process. Well, you're yeah. sucked in. That's Having true. written a letter. Yeah, there's no doubt. You're on the radar, <coughs> you're sucked in, you're, 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 you, it's a choice that you're making to sort of, you know, uh, have the benefit of kind of good guy status with your regulators. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, a, in an uncertain world where you know, people, you know, and again, it really comes down to, you know, the cash flows of your business you look like you definitely are a money transmitter or not. And in, in many, many such Bitcoin businesses do look exactly like that. That's right, that's right, that's right. And, and so, you got to sort of make the call, is this really definitely money transmission? If it is, the best thing to do is to, you know, honestly, is, is to sort of be, a, be you know, Get, get, get in the good graces. Let, you guys, hold on. Let's let me let me finish because there's some really interesting stuff that I want to get to. Besides money transmission, money transmission, I know <laughs> is interesting and it's, it's tough. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the other regulations, and we'll come back to money transmission if you guys still have questions. One of the other really interesting things that people are starting to see right now is securities law, and you know, I, 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 this, this one, money transmission is not my personal forte. It's something that I, I would on off on some of my partners. But securities, securities regulation is something that, that I do, that I teach in, in law school and stuff. And I can tell you that, you know, there are a lot of Bitcoin 2.0, altcoin kind of companies that are out there today that are really over the line. And, and um, I'll, I'll tell you where, I personally, and I don't think my firm has yet come out with a, a point of view on this, but I 
it's, it's in consideration, but, but my personal view of, of kind of where this line gets drawn for, uh, for Bitcoin 2.0 companies is, um, and, and this is actually going to come, we're going to, this will circle back to money transmission, so I'll tie this in, but there's a really interesting <coughs> sort of distinction between a token for a product and a token for a financial return, or a coin that represents a financial return. And, and the way that I would say, where, where I think this comes in is, uh, let's just take um, MadeSafe as, a, as, a, as an example. So what MadeSafe really did was they said, okay, what, what, what's going to happen is this digital quote unquote currency that you're buying is really going to give you access to some storage. And so what people are really buying is storage when they buy this coin. You know, that probably works, right? Because it's a, it's a product that really is nothing more than a, a, a product that is represented by a token, by a, by a, by a crypto pair. <coughs> and we think of all kinds of products. This is going to start to crop up all over the place, right? We're going to start to see all kinds of tokenization of assets. Digital tangible is a good example. Tokenization of gold, tokenization of art, tokenization of securities, overstock is going to do, I mean, that actually is a security. But the, the point, I guess, is that there's, there's this concept of using the blockchain or a blockchain as a ledger uh, technology for tracking ownership that is completely separate and apart from the coin element that we see now in a lot of these altcoins. And the real truth is probably most of these altcoins are being issued because there's this weird, you know, hard to fathom, irrational exuberance for coins. Like people buy them for some reason. Um, and, and so, you know, I mean, it, it really honestly is sort of mind-boggling that somebody would buy an altcoin. Um, just because it's a coin that says the word coin in the title or whatever. I don't know why it is, but People are buying, they have, the, they have this supply and demand, it's the same kind of, people saw Bitcoin, I guess, go crazy, and they figure it will happen, the same thing will happen with these altcoins. So there is this, there really is this market, there really is this supply and demand price of, of an altcoin that, that is separate apart from whatever it's offering as, you know, as a, as a return. But redeemable altcoins that are redeemable for something other than a product are really problematic from the securities law standpoint. If they're redeemable for more coins later in the future, if they're redeemable certainly for cash, redeemable for any kind of financial return or any kind of ownership of, of some network or ownership of some company, you got to be, you got to be, you know, it's, it's very likely that's going to be a security from the securities law standpoint. Yeah. What if, uh, like we asked earlier, we say it's not redeemable for anything, it's just a finite supply, and what happens to it according yeah. to the laws of the code will happen to it? Yeah, so, so a product, right, I mean, uh, antique cars have a, have, have a terrific speculative value, right, because they go up in price, right? Products can go up in price, have a speculative value, and not get security. Okay. Um, the same is true with a tokenized product, right? A product that is represented by a token. The token is not going to be a security if it's redeemable for a product as long as that's really what it's redeemable for. If it's redeemable for something beyond a product that is a financial return, like a percent of um, the money collected from customers <coughs> X, Y, and Z, any kind of financial return like that is going to turn what used to be a product sale, a crowd sale, into crowdfunding. And crowdfunding is not illegal. Crowd sales are. Kickstarter works. If you sell equity, it doesn't work. Unless, and you guys probably are getting confused because crowdfunding, there are some crowdfunder, for example, exists, but they only sell to credit investors. Well, I think, I think I'm confused because the boundary between a token and equity is getting very blurry. Yeah. It, it, it comes down to what's it redeemable for? Is it redeemable for, for only a product that has a consumable value, like a Beanie Baby? Let's say a tokenized Beanie Baby, that's not a security, because the Beanie Baby is a, is a consumable item that I want to buy. And I'm, I'm paying for the Beanie Baby, for the consumption value of that Beanie Baby. Well, what if it's explicitly not for anything? 
Oh yeah, if it's, if it's not for anything, if it's, well, I gotta preface this by saying nobody's really figured this out yet, but Bitcoin itself is probably not a security. Right, because it's not redeemable for anything. I'm really talking about these altcoins that are redeemable for these fancy kind of interesting things. So something, sure. something that's interesting is I think a lot of the companies doing like colored coins and stuff where they would issue something that would we would all agree as a security, like for sharing a company. But the party issuing the coin or like putting that onto the blockchain essentially doesn't enforce that, right? Like the like overstock would directly enforce it. So there's no third party anymore where there was before. Someone's creating it but they don't own it or enforce it. So it kind of doesn't even fit the old paradigm of who is even to register or to be at fault there. It's just a contract between overstock and whoever owns that block on the blockchain. There's no middleman. Yeah, I mean, you're asking an interesting question about, you know, how do you tag the promoter or the issuer in the securities law problem? So that's the security, SEC is going to be looking for a promoter, an issuer, or somebody who is benefiting from the sale of this coin that has a redemption quality. Now, if somebody's redeeming it, somebody, somebody's standing in a position of redeeming it, if you're saying it's a totally distributed redemption right, like the person who sells the coin has to be the one to redeem it, and it's a totally one-to-one -to -one relationship. Uh, I don't know, actually, I haven't thought about that, and that's an interesting concept. But I think you probably still have a security that's a financial return. So, but who? Well, the person who's 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 making the redemption guarantee. The person who's so making the redemption guarantee is selling a security to somebody, saying, "I will, if you give me ten thousand dollars, I will give you a financial return in the future." And, and it's truly that broad, and I know that's shocking, but it, it, it's not about equity, it's not about share of ownership that, that creates securities. There's something called investment contracts that create securities. So it's any kind of financial return is going to get you in trouble. Yeah? What if you split up that into the car? Yeah, or ownership of a pool of cars. So yeah. the class not, not a pool of cars, but a car, no, a single car, car, one product, split and then owned by 15 people. Right. So the classic, I mean, it still fits the pattern. The, the, the classic securities law case law is this case called Howard. It, it literally is about an orange grove being split up into, into portions. And when you start to split something up, and there's somebody who's selling portions of something, and, and somebody else is getting a financial return, I'm going to get X percent of the sale of my portion of something, that's a security. It's literally that broad. And people really think of it as, well, geez, you know, if it's not like ownership of a company, then it's not a security. That's not right. Because investment contracts, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing what what constitutes securities. So, like, what if someone were to, like, have a gamified type options, you know, type market for all coins, say, like Bitcoin? That would be a security. If like calls and puts type. All right, so let's, okay, I'm glad you raised that because I want to get to that. That's actually the next cool thing I want to talk about. So so after we get past securities laws, ne the next interesting thing is commodities laws. Now, the interesting thing is all these things can exist. And I'm going to come back to how money transmission ties into this too. But the commodities laws are another really important new development that we're starting to see because everybody is finally starting to talk about derivatives and, and how to do fancy trading because, you know, why not? I mean, you can make a ton of money. Anybody in Chicago will tell you that trading <laughs> options is a huge oh, yeah. uh, lucrative thing. And, you know, Bitcoin and all these altcoins and all the incredible arbitrage opportunities that exist because the trading is not particularly uh, efficient, you know, could result in some really, and probably it, there are people in this room who probably made it killing on some of the arbitrage opportunities. And that, that exists, and, and people have started to think about how to do you know, derivatives trading of Bitcoin and other altcoins. And, and that is going to be governed by CF, or excuse me, um, yeah, CFTC. And the CFTC, up, up until now, Bitcoin probably is a commodity, but all the trading, theoretically, that happens in Bitcoin up until now has been spot trading. And the CFTC doesn't get involved in, in spot trading. You know, it's, that's kind of a big carve out to uh, to, to the commodities and futures exchange um, jurisdiction. Is you know they only they only really regulate if 
you're not delivering the product immediately at the point of sale. And, and uh, Bitcoin almost certainly is a commodity. That's not been decided yet, but if it's anything, it's probably a commodity. It's, probably, it's like gold. It's like a piece of property. I just said it's property that fits perfectly in the notion that it's a commodity. So I think the trading, the interest in trade, industry trading, the fancy trading is all going to be um, regulated by the CFTC at some point. Yeah. The role of CFTC was to just guarantee a certain standard of product for the delivery. So I think an issue for CFTC is how do they guarantee the quality of the product? Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, Bitcoin is is. You know, like like other commodities, is a commodity. It's it's hard to figure out, you know, how you could possibly create a different set of values around Bitcoin. It is what it is. Um, but the reality is, the contract that you enter into as to the Bitcoin is what's interesting. And 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 when it starts to be fancy trading, just like it is for soybeans, which you know can't possibly be anything other than a soybean. You, know, you can't really make a, a, a false claim about soybeans because they are what they are, just like Bitcoin. All coins you can make a bunch of false yeah. claims about, but commodities you probably can't. So to guarantee the quality of the Bitcoin, you would just check the block. That's right. That's right. And, and so that's why I say it's probably a commodity, right? It's probably like some of these other types of things that are not. There's not a lot of value judgments to be made. It's just it is what it is. But the trading, that's why, and that's precisely why the CFTC doesn't regulate spot trading. Because spot trades are too simple, and it's a commodity, and, it, and there can't possibly be, you know, a problem with somebody who has decided, you know, who's taken possession of something immediately and so forth. But when you start to get into fancy trading, where the where the contract itself, the contract of sale itself, starts to have these weird provisions in it, that's where the CFTC starts to get interested, um, because you know, you're talking about future future delivery of something. That might not occur, and so um, there's often lots of intricate, you know, puts and call options and stuff that start to get fancy. Yeah. So you have the CFTC and you have the SEC. <clears throat> Each one of those are actually overseen by different parts of Congress, with different players. So I'm wondering, as application developers, are there certain nuances or things because they have two different branches of trade? Does that translate to two different sets of considerations for folks on the moon? I'm not sure it does. I, I, I personally would much rather be regulated by the CFTC than the SEC, I think. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah. I, 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 it'll it's, be, it's, a, it's a more... And it's more natural. I mean, more I, natural I really do think that the, the, the fancy trading means that the trading is, let's face it, the trading is where the abuses can, it's not, there's really nothing to disclose about Bitcoin. I mean, the SEC is a disclosure regime, and there's nothing that disclosure is going to help, really. It's, it's a commodity that, that, that trades, you know, and, and, and the complexity of those trades needs to be regulated, it seems like, just like any commodity. What? So it's only for sleep, right? I, I raised a couple hundred grand. I've got this company. I'm doing Bitcoin swaps to fund margin trading. It's going really well. People trade on my books. Um, I want to run with the CFTC. I want to come to the regular Yeah, so, I mean. Yeah, what is it do? Yeah, and, and you're, you're hitting the nail on the head, and like the states, the CFTC doesn't have rules yet for Bitcoin. Yet. So, why aren't we lobbying the CFTC instead of NYD? I guess I'm worried these freaks are. Yeah. Well, there are two different issues, but let's, get, but, um, but let's circle back because I want to actually tie in the securities law piece to the money transmission, because I, I think there's an interesting thing here. One of, one of the things that we're seeing, again, is this dichotomy between products that are tokenized and financial returns that are tokenized. Financial returns that are tokenized are probably securities, but products, and again, whether it's art or gold or you know any kind of um, tokenized asset, right, to me, should not be money transmission, because you're not, you don't have what is effectively a fungible, um, you know, um, I mean, when you think, let's just think for a minute about in-game gold versus in-game Vorpal swords, right? 
product, like a vorpal sword, has a cost. And so you can translate it into something fungible, but it's not itself fungible. You wouldn't ever pay for something with a vorpal sword, but in-game gold you would. Because the gold itself has this fungibility quality. It's intended to be used as a means of exchange. And, and everything else in the game, you know, has a, a, a denomination in that gold. So similarly, I think there's this concept that we're going to start to see, I hope, where people start to say, look, if it's truly a product that we're tokenizing, then, okay, it's, it's, it's not money transmission, right? It can't be because it's not a coin, it's not, it's not a fungible, good, it, it's, it's not something that has secondary market value. I mean, maybe it does, I mean, every product does have secondary market value. I mean, that's, that's part of where we get caught up is that everything has a value at the end of the day. But it's not intended to be a value that is fungible, that is, that is used as a means of, of, of paying for things, right? So, so we're, that's kind of what we're hoping to see the bit license, but probably not, but maybe some other states will start to kind of get this, this concept. Yeah? Do you think that distinction will kind of break down as normal swords are tradable in seconds on markets? I mean, Ultimately, if everything has value, it is fungible to some extent. I don't think so. I mean, I, I think there has to be something, something there, there has to be this this idea of uh, it's the it's the medium it's the medium of exchange. It's the medium of uh, things are are translatable into it and you can buy things with it. I mean, there's no other way to do it because otherwise everything would be money transmission. Right, but I'm saying once you have sufficiently developed markets, I mean, I would be willing to trade for Vorpal Swords instead of money if yeah. I'm confident that someone else will accept them. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting philosophical point. And, and, you know, I mean, the whole point, let, let's talk about what is the point of money transmission regulation? Now, the point of money transmission regulation is probably two major things. One is this AML thing. Or, you know, crap, we've got, you know, we've got to somehow regulate the supply and, and the transmission of money from bad guys, you know, to bad guys. And uh, we've got to somehow figure out where the bad guys are getting in, involved. That's the AML piece. Probably, again, it really does matter that it's a currency. I mean, you're not going to be able to, I mean, theoretically, the bad guys could pay each other in the apartments of eggs. Right, well, I guess my question is, once that's possible, right now it's not possible to pay each other to, for terrorists to finance their stuff with cartons of eggs. And once they can finance projects because with tokens, tokens that represent yeah. cartons of eggs, and with yeah. the natural next step for the government be to well, say that, that they know, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous question you're asking. <laughs> but a good one. I mean, you're right. I mean, there's, there's a legitimate issue there, right? Because we're making... We're, we're, when, when you tokenize something, you are potentially create, making it so much easier to deliver effectively ownership of that thing that it makes it so much more easily fungible and usable as a, as, as a, as a medium of exchange. Who knows? But I mean, well, hopefully, it's liquid as money, right? Right. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, why couldn't you if you cut uh, the, the live stream off? But I mean, if you were Al Qaeda and you could sell like decentralized storage tokens. I mean, that's just <laughs> <laughs> Should I shut up? I don't know. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's a good philosophical point. I mean, it really is. And, yeah. and, and technology is evolving to the point where if we tokenize all of our products, it begs the question, maybe everything should be money transmission and regulated in that way. Um, but the other, the other piece of it, of course, is the consumer protection piece of um, somebody walks into Western Union, hands them money, and doesn't quite know what happens next. And so um, that's kind of the, the, the underpinning of, of all the state money transmission laws is really the kind of consumer protection piece of, you know, we got we to make sure people's money actually gets to where it's supposed to go. And, and you know, again, it's, it's, it's the same idea here. When you, when you sort of tokenize things, um, you know, it's not the same, it doesn't have the same feeling to a consumer, when you think about it, that it should be regular. Like, consumers are used to getting screwed by merchants, right? I mean, if you're buying a product and, and there's, there's a process there, and, you know, the, the uh, CFPB, the Consumer Protection uh, uh, Board, has started to 
get interested in Bitcoin too, which is another shoe that's going to drop um, that uh, really deals with the consumer protection piece of it and the, the fact that we don't have chargebacks, you know, uh, available with, uh, with Bitcoin. And that's going to be another really interesting problem potentially down the road. It hasn't become one yet, but... Uh, so are you saying the CP Consumer Protection Bureau can actually issue laws that if people don't get their money back because they, they lost their passphrase or they lost their private keys? It's a darn good question, right? Because I mean, really right now, who does it? It's Visa and MasterCard and their, and their, and their contracts with people. They, they, and all the chargeback thing is really a contractually mandated thing. And it's not a, it's not a legal issue. But could CFPB potentially someday come out with some some rules? Probably not. Probably needs an act of Congress to actually put that in place. Um, CFPB probably would do something more along the lines of disclosure, perhaps, about the lack of chargebacks and force force that kind of thing. Along the lines of the bit license guys have there suggested. Was, there was a pushback, though. They're not from this group, but the other groups, I would say, about the chargebacks? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, so it wouldn't even come out of Probably right. Yeah. Yes. You've been kind of tiptoeing around the edge of this, but when the FinCEN regs came out, they gave me impression this was sort of the first <laughs> trial essay, and maybe this was going to change. And so the question is, has the cement dried, or is it still soft? Are they going to revise these? Are they going to add more? Is it going to be more consumer protection stuff? Yeah, crystal ball time. You know, you hear that? You yeah. Let me repeat the question: Is as as the cement dried on FinCEN's guidance? Originally, they sort of said this is a trial balloon. Um, to mix my metaphors horribly, I I I I don't know the answer to that. You know, I I think. Um, I think all the regulators are still scratching their heads, and quite honestly, I think we haven't finished Innovate, right, as, as a community. I think we're going to see really new and different uses of this, this underlying technology, again, that I'm hoping are going to create, start to create at least a dichotomy between what is money transmission, what isn't money transmission, based more on sort of products, to, you know, tokenized products versus true coins and true currency substitutes. Um, but we'll see. I, I don't know. Yes. So when did you when does it make sense to incorporate outside of the United States then? <laughs> <laughs> well, I get asked that question a lot. Um, and uh, it's a long answer, but I'll try to give you the short version. So uh, it, it it kind of depends mostly on who your investors and stockholders who who your stockholders are. So that's founders and investors. And employees to some extent. If everybody's a U.S. citizen anyway, you're not going to get around any of this. If your if your main market is in the U.S. and everybody's a U.S. citizen, you're all subject to U.S. law, and it doesn't matter if you have a Netherlands company or, or an Isle of Man company or, or a Swiss company or whatever, you know, because you're going to be your U.S. citizens violating U.S. law. So it's a very simplistic way of saying um, the U.S. guys aren't going to get out of it anyway. Even if you're going to perform overseas. Yeah. Not, not long ago, uh, one person inquired to me about acquiring Bitcoins. And the way I responded to them was I sent them a whole slew of emails uh, with .gov endings about Bitcoin, like sec.gov about Bitcoin. Uh, and then articles about Bitcoin being possibly potentially dangerous at all. And the reason for that was I didn't want someone to get involved with Bitcoin. We never had Bitcoin before. Class, for example, a compromised system uh, where they acquire Bitcoins and then see them disappear into their own into their own property. Uh, also, I wouldn't want someone to acquire them from some props computer. So I sent plenty of information. Then the person was even more excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and this is from experience. I used to only deal with qualified purchases in the past. And so this is like standard procedure to say this is super dangerous. You're probably going to lose everything. But if you're secure, you'll get to keep what you got, essentially. So um, I'm all for these types of things. 
that people should not be going to blockchain.info while they have Keylogger installed on there, <laughs> or Coinbase plus Keylogger. And then you got a month, two months later, someone accumulates some Bitcoins, and then they're gone. Uh, yes. Is there a question? The point is Chicago, I know Chicago, the, the consumer protection. So these types of things, option business. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. And I, and I mean, you know, there's a lot, Bit license is a good example. There's a lot of stuff in there about a lot of different things. You know, the consumer protection piece <coughs> probably is not the battle you want to pick. Yeah. Could you speak to the exemptions uh, from FinCEN that um, may apply to our startup companies that we may want to look at? Um, I think there are five or six exemptions under the April, March uh, advisory from FinCEN that may be relevant to us. Could you speak to those? Yeah. Including the ones about the precious metals. <laughs> uh, well, so mining companies, which, you know, FinCEN kind of came out, and, and FinCEN has, actually, to your, to your earlier point, FinCEN came out with the guidance in April, but has come out with various letter rulings iterating on that guidance and creating additional kind of uh, clarity on it. So uh, in one of those letters, you know, miners, I think, uh, were, were sort of de facto sort of taken out of that. Category, but uh, but yeah. So so um, there is a whole different set of rules, and we've done three or four memos on eagles, and, and uh, uh, yeah, no, that's that's right. Eagles eagles got its own sort of interesting, but it's exempt, right? Um, yeah. I'm not going to say that on camera. <laughs> it's, it's got a separate set of, of uh, rules that you, you and I are going to have to talk about <laughs> sooner or later. Yeah, anybody else want to try to get an exemption out of it? <laughs> yes, uh, I, I believe that uh, you have an exemption if you if you trade a product or service directly for a token or coin. Oh, yes. Yes, that's true. Yes, because, yeah, the, the sort of end user. What, right. uh, if you have a, a business that says gives virtual currency as a reward for user interaction, say for a tweet, is that business considered a money transmitter or requires bit license under the, you know, the new regulations for rewards, uh, so to speak? It's still convertible money. Yeah, it, it really does. So yeah, exactly. It comes down to a lot of uh, questions around, is it virtual currency to begin with? Um, yes, yeah, so it's virtual currency, but it's coming from the website as a reward for an interaction. Maybe the virtual currency is uh, retradable before it's redeemed. But it's originally issued as a census for the work. Yes. I'm sorry, guys. Give me that, give me that back pattern again. If, so, you guys probably know about Uptweet. Uptweet is a social media site that rewards people for interactions on Twitter. And the site is paying out the user for that interaction. And the site is the owner and the custodian of the Bitcoin before it's they've been handed out to the user, and the user can't can't send or receive with this coin, they can only, you know, withdraw, essentially. And, and, and is the coin redeemable for fiat, or is it not redeemable at all? Is it Bitcoin? It's yeah, it's Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin. Uh, and the site's giving it out, just literally giving it out for free. They're not charging for not it. Not charging for it. The only thing they want is an up, is, is That's still the consideration. consideration. There's still consideration. So they're paying you. They're paying you. Yeah, I mean, so the party is decided to counter the user, but they're paying the user to do something. There's an, obviously, there's an argument here that uh, it's really you know, an end user transaction where they're paying their service provider for the services, right? As opposed to, uh, you know, there's no three, it's not a three party transaction, it's a two party transaction. Yes. They're paying somebody to render services. Um, but you know, the bit, if, if we're talking about the bit license, that's it might actually be covered by the bit license, just to give everybody a sense of how broad that is. So yeah, that's why the bit license is though. Under the bit, well, uh, so the bit license actually is not under the money transmission laws, which is a whole another interesting discussion because it doesn't actually technically give you an exemption under the money transmission laws in New York. Even if you get the bit license, it isn't quite clear what that means. Um, I think it probably means you have an exemption as a practical matter, but, um, uh, but the bottom line is, yeah, I think that I think I think that you have a problem 
independent of, uh, and, and by the way, there's a whole other piece where New York probably doesn't have the kind of money transmission laws to regulate sort of the, the direct sale model to begin with. So that, that probably wouldn't be money transmission, but it probably would require a bit license, oddly enough, in New York. In New York. How are we doing on time? Uh, we have two more minutes for some really, really good, hard questions for Lola that will knock his socks off. Come on, guys. That's a good question. Does anyone want to do a distributed securities exchange? How do I get a license for that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Ryan, what you're talking about. What do you mean by distributed securities exchange? What do you mean by distributed securities exchange? I mean, I want to facilitate on blockchain trades of Microsoft stock. Oh, OK. Uh, we'll find out soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's 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 under consideration. I have a question. What if you know with pre-buying that that coin does, you know, with using those funds, let's say they're receiving US dollar down to coin and you use those funds to back up your you know, whatever your company is or your goal. Let's say there's some sort of precious thing. And you're not, but let's say, you know, when you, they retrieve, you want to retrieve your funds, you're not giving them the gold, you're maybe giving it back to the US dollars on the That is a very what? interesting fact. Can we get the question So let me, so I think what, what's being asked is, you've got a situation similar to Liberty Reserve. <laughs> now you know how I'm going to ask. Where, uh, but you're going to postulate that unlike Liberty Reserve, it's really not a Ponzi scheme. And that you've, you've got you've got it you've got it backed by some asset. Let's call it gold. Let's call it silver. Whatever. Right. Some asset backs it up, but you're going to also redeem it for cash instead. I think there's a variety of sort of issues there. We talked about the fact that Eagle has its own set of statutes that, that have to kind of come into play here. But let's say it's um, let's not let's not use gold as an example. Let's use um, uh, antique cars. Okay. Um, so it, you know. You can, you can redeem the coin for antique cars or at the option of the uh, company that would otherwise have redeemed for antique cars, you can redeem it for cash. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the issue that you're going to have to deal with from a, from a money transmission point of view is that you're probably going to wind up, you know, I, I think what, when you really think this through as to how you're going to set this up as a practical matter, you're going to wind up being a centralized virtual currency where the company that is offering to redeem is probably, you know, the issuer and the administrator, right. and is probably undoubtedly going to be in the money transmission suit both federal and state. And it's harder, by the way, to be a centralized money transmission than just to be a decentralized money transmission based on the stuff you have to collect because you have the records. Right. Uh, one last question. Just regarding uh, make it good. Well, <laughs> regarding international money transmission, like you know, Stellar, which is come out, and you know whether we're speaking about money transmission is really only in the U.S. or is there, are there a whole I, of the Yeah, I am. I am only speaking about the U.S. And, and so it's bad enough in the U.S. that we have federal and forty-eight states, and then you have. But the, the one good thing about international is we've been talking about Europe, for example, is just one license that you need. That would be a really nice model if you could figure out how to make that work here. In Latin America? Yeah, Latin America is every state and province kind of has its own mm -hmm. situation. And, and there, there are countries in Latin America, by the way. We, I'll give, here's, here's the plug. So um, Perkins has something called the Virtual Currency Report. And we actually have, on, on our blog, we do have internationally, we have, and actually we're coming out with, it, with an iPhone app. That also lists all the uh, uh, various international positions on digital currency. There are some countries that are that are actively talking about banning it altogether, in, in, and you can imagine the ones, you know, that have really difficult um, problems with inflation, hyperinflation, that are really threatened by digital currency. Is it true that Ecuador has, has Ecuador, banned? It? Yeah, it has. Well, they haven't banned it, but they've said they're 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 likely to. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that it's, somebody said yeah we're gonna be in this. It's looking like it's gonna happen.